A study in 2013 shows that Wisconsin incarcerated more black men than any other state in the United States, in spite of the fact that the black population is only 6.5%. Also, Wisconsin has a very high rate of incarceration for indigenous people. So in light of the recent events in Kenosha, the Department of Corrections building was burned to the ground. And I have with me today, two people that work with the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee to talk about Wisconsin, its prison population, and what's going on inside the prison in terms of organizing the incarcerated workers. So joining me today is Robert Thibault and Ron Schroeder. Thank you for joining me, Robert, Ron. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. The first question I want to uh, address to Robert, though, is what has changed since the 2013 study in terms of the incarceration rate for people of color and conditions in the in the prison system? Well, in Wisconsin, very little has changed. Uh, the numbers have held about even, or or maybe gone up a little bit. Um, other states have made some significant changes to reduce their prison populations, but Wisconsin has resisted all those changes. Uh, part of it was the um, administration, Department of Corrections um, and the governor in our state until two years ago uh, were not interested in it. Um, and uh, a system had developed where um, especially people of color, um, black, Hispanic, uh, Native American in Wisconsin, were very highly uh, targeted, um, incarcerated at uh, much higher levels than anybody else. Um, that's really helped keep our prisons full. The other thing that um, we have is a uh, routine in the state where probation officers can uh, revoke someone's um, extended supervision, to use the right term, um, for a rule violation. Um, any little thing, not a new breaking the law, just not following a, some rule. Um, and that keeps the prisons pretty full. The uh, last numbers I have that I'm sure of, uh, 2018, um, of the adults who were incarcerated that year, 45% of them were not new cases, but people who were being revoked by the probation officers without a new trial. Um, just sent back for more prison time. Um, so we're going nowhere. Ron, can you tell me what role did uh, the former governor Scott Walker play in this uh, crazy level of incarceration? I can. Governor Scott Walker co-wrote the truth and sentencing law, which means a person spends day for day in prison without any opportunity for early release for good time. In addition to that, under Scott Walker's administration, the state has allocated more funds for corrections than it has for higher education. The state spends more money to incarcerate uh, than to educate. And the same applies for treatment, uh, a, a vast, majority of uh, African Americans are arrested uh, and incarcerated for low-level drug offenses. And the state, especially under Scott Walker's administration, has chosen to spend more money on corrections imprisoning minorities than it has for rehabilitating. You know, I mean, everybody across the nation is uh, aware of what happened in Kenosha. Uh, but recently the Department of Correction was burned down. Uh, what happened, and, and I'd just like to have, just have some opinions, why did 
the situation get to that point, the boiling point that has led to all of this stuff going on now? Yeah, I think there's two questions in there. Um, well, as Ron was mentioning, um, Governor Walker actually, a lot of what he started was when he was a state senator. So we're going back to the late 90s where you know they started increasing penalties and you know locking people up and filling up the jails. Um, so it's been going on a long time. Um, and then what I was saying before about the um, probation agents um, being able to do basically whatever they wanted, um, that's been a real um, hot point with anybody not only the people who are on probation, but their families, because all of a sudden somebody's just locked up on a whim uh, or what seems to be a whim. Um, and, and that's, you know, Black Lives Matter, we keep hearing and we keep, that's focused on what's happening on the streets with the police, but it also goes into the prisons because the whole criminal justice system starts with the police on the streets, but it goes to the prisons too. Um, so that's, I think, why that office um, was just a tar was a target, a, a site, um, you know, for the, the anger to be brought out on. Um, as to, you know, why we got to the flashpoint, I think it's because the people in uh, that city um, are tired of nothing changing. We've seen all this discussion for, seems forever, but especially the last few months. And um, we still have people being shot um, for no reason, really. Um, and people like the Kenosha police um, don't have, and the sheriff's department don't have body cameras. Um, they didn't think it was important. Uh, it's in the budget for 2022. Um, so very definitely, you know, the people were angry because nothing's changing. Bob is correct. What happened in Kenosha is a culmination, is a result of a culmination of years and years of oppression and uh, uh, police officers shooting young unarmed black men. Uh, and it turns out to be the, the, that young person's word against the cops. Uh, and there's, there's an appearance or uh, a but wide belief that uh, uh, that young black men don't stand a chance when it's their word against the police officers. Uh, make no mistake, Eddie, uh, Bob, I, nor I walk condone violence of any sort, but we certainly reject uh, violence and abuse of authority, uh, any type of excessive violence uh, towards anyone, especially uh, young unarmed people. Uh, uh, both of y'all can answer this because I'm I'm curious. Talk a little bit about the uh, Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. What is it and why did y'all start it? I walk is just that, an organizing committee uh, designed specifically for people that are incarcerated. We feel it's important uh, to identify the problems within the Wisconsin prison systems and to uh, alert people in authority, namely prison wardens, the secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Corrections and our lawmakers uh, of the various abuses that they're subjected to. It's widely perceived as modern day slavery. And what I mean by that, or as an example is many Incarcerated adults in Wisconsin earn $8 a month. And a tube of toothpaste this year can cost as high as $8 a tube. So to put that into perspective, if a person in the community is earning $10 an hour, $400 a week, uh, that would be the equivalent of a citizen paying $1,600 for a tube of toothpaste it's understandable why it's widely perceived as modern day slavery. And IWOC is doing the best that we can uh, to shed light on these injustices. For background, um, 
Industrial Workers Organizing Committee or uh, Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee um, was formed in 2014. It's a part of the Industrial Workers of the World, which was founded in 1914 or something like that. Um, and it was, uh, as Ron was saying, it was founded to um, give a voice to the people incarcerated because um, you know they can complain the system and the system just rejects their complaints. They can complain to the warden. They have they don't have a voice. Um, I think one of the biggest things uh, I see IWOC doing is creating a voice outside, making people aware, um, helping families and others, other advocates, if you will, community organizations, uh, bring pressure uh, with the administrations. Uh, in some cases, our, the Secretary of the Department of Corrections doesn't necessarily know what a warden in a particular prison is doing. He thinks they're following certain procedures, like wearing masks, for COVID and the people aren't. Um, so being a voice for the people who don't have it is probably the biggest thing we do, I feel. Well, what can the public do, or family, loved ones, supporters, or just people that's concerned about condition? What can they do uh, uh, if you got some advice Eddie, the vast majority of people are not aware of the conditions and the abuses that occur in Wisconsin prisons uh, until they themselves are incarcerated or someone close to them is incarcerated. We have a wonderful example of a, a professional woman who recently earned, uh, 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 joined IWOC. Uh, she knew nothing about uh, the conditions and the abuses. Uh, until her a, a relative of hers was incarcerated uh, and then her eyes became very wide open and she has become a very fierce advocate not just for her relative uh, but for others that are uh, who have incarcerated loved ones that are facing the same type of abuses so to answer your question uh, what can uh, people on the ground do uh, if they don't have someone that they know is incarcerated, uh, we strongly encourage them to, to join an organization such as IWOC and get involved, uh, be a voice. Uh, everyone contributes in different ways. One of my favorite ways of explaining this tongue in cheek, uh, my definition of a Republican is someone who has never had a family member involved in the correction system. Because once you have somebody involved in the system, your opinion changes very quick. Um, the best thing we can do, and we're actually blessed, uh, it, at least in Southeast Wisconsin and Madison areas, we have a number of organizations that are trying to um, make changes. Um, ACLU in Wisconsin has been storming the Capitol um, because our Republican Assembly was still trying to build new prisons as of February. Um, you know, at one point they, they try to say they're going to change things, but at another point they're building new prisons. Um, well, made enough noise that that bill got killed. Um, Prison Action Milwaukee is another group I work with that tries to work with families because the families can be um, almost even more isolated um, out and alone trying to figure out what to do and how to get things done. Um, Wisdom, Expo, Project Return, we have a whole bunch of organizations. If anybody wants to find out more, they can contact any of these people. Um, if they get more informed, they'll get angry and, and they'll start getting on the phones, uh, taking a look at who they vote for, um, helping to make change, which right now it sounds like maybe we're going to be able to do some of that. At least we're hoping so. 
So that's what, that's what I hope can come from some of these discussions. Um, there's some real change. Okay, thanks for joining me, Robert, Ron. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for having us today, Eddie. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.